Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of our minister and Kirk Session, we give you all a warm welcome to our service this morning. And on your behalf, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Andrew as our guest speaker this morning and this evening. Andrew, you're very welcome. And this evening's service at 6 p.m. preceded by a time of prayer at 5.30. This evening, Andrew will uh, be interviewing Joe Montgomery. So please do come along and support that. Please continue to remember in your prayer all those going on outreach during the summer months. And also do remember our Shine Week, the 24th to the 30th of July. Services next Sunday will be conducted by our minister, the Reverend John Mullen. And uh, thanks to Catherine and the choir for leading our praise this morning. These are all the announcements. Now call upon Andrew to lead our morning worship. Thank you, Andrew. Morning. You're all very welcome to Castle Dawson this morning. Whether you're a regular or a visitor here every Sunday or just um, this is the first Sunday, we're delighted you're here. Now, I don't know what happened between Curran and Castle Dawson. When I left Curran, the sun was splitting the stones and it's now raining in Castle Dawson. So I'm not sure if I bought the rain or not, but I'm delighted to be here and it's good to see you all this morning. If you're watching online, we want to make you a very specially welcome as well. We're going to stand and worship God together now and, uh, and sing our first hymn, which I have down as Psalm 100. Just before I lead us in prayer, let me read to you a couple of verses from Psalm 22. David writes, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. 
Let's come before God now in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God, our Father in heaven, we want to say like the psalmist that was in you that our father and our mother trusted. It was in you that the generations that have preceded us trusted. It's in you and you alone that our forebears have put their faith in. And as we meet here this morning in Castle Dawson, we stand on their shoulders we want to thank you for all in their lives that was good and godly. And we thank you, Father, that the gospel has been preached here in, in Northern Ireland for generations and centuries. We want to thank you that the gospel has been preached here in this church. And we want to thank you for that promise in Corinthians that as one sows and another reaps that it she alone gives the increase. As we meet here this morning, we want to say that we put our trust and our confidence in you and in you alone. Father, we confess that we get distracted. We confess that we get disillusioned. We confess that our memories are not good. And we confess so often, Father, we put our confidence and our trust elsewhere, very often in ourselves. Father, we want to come and we want to say that we're sorry. We're sorry for the sin in our lives. We're sorry that our vision is so easily clouded. We're sorry, Father, that our hearts so often produce idols where we fall away from you. We're sorry, Lord, that our lives are so full of unbelief despite the truth of the gospel that we hear, despite the evidence of the gospel that we see. So often we decide that it's not true and we want to paddle our own canoe and go off in our own direction. But we come this morning, Lord, humbly and asking that you would forgive us. Our gracious God, we thank you that you are the one who is perfect. We thank you that you had a plan before this world was even created. We thank you that in your will and in your plan that you have ordained all things. We thank you that there's not a raindrop or a blade of grass or a hair or a cell that's out of place, but you know them all. We thank you that you're the God who makes appointments and you're the God who makes sure that every appointment is kept. We thank you that we're here this morning in church. Thank you for every young person, every child in church this morning, for every family and an older person that brought them here. Lord, thank you for everyone that's here this morning and everyone that's watching online. We don't believe it's by chance or by fluke. Whenever we read the book of Esther, we know that the dice is rolled, but you and you alone decide. And so, Father, as you've brought us here this morning, every single one of us, as we're all gathered together, you've brought us for that great purpose, that we might come to you, that we might worship you, that we might declare your praises and that we might honor you and love you. Father, we ask that you would speak to us this morning. Speak to us who are young. Speak to us who have only heard the gospel once or twice and speak to us, Lord, who are old and have heard the gospel thousands of times. Speak to us so that we might delight in you and that we might run to you and that we might crave more of you in our lives, that we might hate sin and that we might love your son. So bless our service, bless our time together for your glory and for our good. Amen. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to speak to the boys and girls. I'm looking around this morning, and the girls definitely outnumber the boys. But girls and boys, I'm going to go down to the front, just in front of the communion table in a moment, and I'm going to go down and talk to you there. But just before, we're going to read God's Word together. So if you have a Bible, and I'm going to encourage you to open up your Bible. Maybe Mum will open it up for you, or Dad. And we're going to read together from Mark chapter 15, from verse 21 to the end of verse 39. And then, boys and girls, we're going to think about this bit of the Bible together. So you'll find it really helpful. Even if you can't read all the words, maybe mom and dad will just help you to follow with their finger. And we're going to read Mark 15, 21 to 39. This is God's Word. Now we're at the crucifixion of Jesus. Verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross and they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. 
And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. And so also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who was stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Amen. And we do thank God for this as word. Boys and girls, if you want to go down to the front and I'll see you there. Brilliant, fantastic, keep coming. This is really wonderful. There's normally some upstairs as well. Don't see anybody there today. That's okay. Well, great, great to have you all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Eight, eight, right. I'm just, it was just a tester for you. See if you're awake. Here's another tester question. Now, I have to, excuse me for standing up, but I want to make sure everybody can see me. Does anybody remember the Bible passage that I read just one moment ago, what it was about. I read a bit in the Bible. What was it about? Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. That's exactly the right answer. What's your name? Ella. Ella. Ella, would you help me this morning? Would you stand up and help me? Ella, I've got a picture, just as you've said. You stand here, Ella, and I'm going to show everybody this. This is a picture of the cross. See it? See it upstairs as well. Maybe they catch it in the camera. And Ella's going to hold this for me. This is a picture, boys and girls, of the three crosses. Now, you know and I know that this is not the real cross. This is just a picture to help us understand. But Jesus died in a middle cross. And then there was two thieves on either side of him. And we're going to think about that this morning. And to help us think about it, I'm going to tell you some things that happened to me on my holiday. Any older person going on a holiday this year? Anybody going to Port Rush, Port Stewart, Donegal, Cranfield and Kilkeel? Any big spenders? Okay, well, I'm going to tell you about my holiday. And I have three things to show you for my holiday that are going to help us think about Jesus dying on the cross. Here's the first one. What's this? A suitcase. Well done. And here's the second one. An envelope. Well done. And here's the third. Weights. And we're going to think about those, and Ella, you're looking at me and saying, what are you doing this morning? Well, I'm going to explain to you something about Jesus and the cross from each of those three things. Where will we start? Will we start with a suitcase? Okay, boys and girls, whenever you go on holiday, why do you need a suitcase? <laughs> to keep your things in. And what kind of things would you put in your suitcase? You'd put, you'd put your clothes, your clothes and? Yeah, you're a planner. All the days you need and all the clothes. And you put your toothbrush and your toothpaste and your soap and you put it all in your suitcase. Well, this is my suitcase. And whenever I went on holiday, I went down to Belfast and I went to the person at EasyJet check-in and I handed them my suitcase. And then I said, suitcase, bye-bye. I'll see you in London. And then we're going off to Montenegro. But boys and girls, my suitcase didn't make it in London. I went on holiday and the suitcase returned to Portrush. And so my suitcase, boys and girls, was, what word would he use for a suitcase that goes on a holiday without you? My suitcase was lost. And this is the tag from EasyJet. There are other airlines. Um, and this is the tag where they put in my suitcase because my suitcase was lost. And I couldn't get it, and I couldn't get any of my stuff. And so I had to go on holiday without my suitcase and all my stuff. 
And I was thinking of that word lost. Ella, hold up that picture of the cross for us again. Boys and girls, you just look at this picture. Older people as well. What do you see when you look at this picture? Well, let me tell you one of the things that you have to see. Jesus died on the cross for people who were lost. Now, not lost in that Jesus couldn't find them, but because of sin, we're lost. Sin separates us from God. And one of the words that the Bible uses for that separation from God is you're lost. You're like sheep who are lost. And because of our sin, we're lost. We're far from God. We can't know God. We're not friends with God. That's what sin does. And all of us are born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Because of our sin, we're lost. When you look at the cross, when you think about the cross, Jesus died for lost people. Do you think you're lost? Do you think you're spiritually lost because of your sin? Well, if you don't think that, you should, because Jesus went to the cross because we're lost. Here's the second thing. What will we talk about next? The, well, I'm going to save the weights. I knew you wanted the weights. I'm going to talk about the envelope. Let me show you this. Now, you're probably going to think it's really boring, but I have a story to tell you. When I got my holidays, I went to a place called Croatia, and I went to a place called Dubrovnik. Anybody been to Dubrovnik? Nobody. Okay, well, I went to Dubrovnik. I didn't know anything about it either. And there's a big wall all the way around Dubrovnik. Makes Derry's walls look small. Anyway, and I was walking around these walls on the top of Dubrovnik. And there was a person, and they were sitting in a wee seat. And they had a paintbrush in one hand. And what do you think they were doing? They were painting. And they were painting these pictures. And I went up to the man, and there's nobody else near him in these walls. I says, how much is your picture? He says, 30 euro. I said, look, I'll give you 15 euro for that one you're doing now. He said, that's a deal. I says, just one more condition. I want you to put me in the picture. I want you to put me in the picture. And he said, okay, I'll put you in it. But for 15 euro, I said, it's a deal. Can anybody find me in the picture? Now, I'm on the walls of Dubrovnik here. Can anybody see me? Correct. What's your name? Susanna. That's exactly it. Now, I'm just a wee small man. But you see me? I'll sign this and sell it to you for 40 euro if you want. But this is me in my own picture. And the man put me in the picture. But there's something I want to ask you. When you look at this picture, are you in it? Are you in it? But boys and girls, I know we weren't there. But in another sense, we have to be there. Because when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus died for me. I'm not, I really wasn't there standing. But when Jesus died, he was thinking about me. When he died on the cross, he died for me. And it's as if I put myself in the picture. I wasn't absent that day. I wasn't forgotten about. I was there because Jesus died on the cross for me. And boys and girls, whenever you look at the cross and older people, when you think about Jesus dying, can you say, Jesus died for me? Here's the last thing. Who wants to come and hold these for me? Oh, I, come on, I have to ask you, don't you? You were keen. What's your name? Ross. What is it? Ross. Ross, good man. You hold those for me. Hold them up high. Let's see how high you can lift them. Are they heavy, Ross? No, no problem to you. No problem. Well, Ross, you take your seat there. Who would, who would be holding weights but a strong man? Well, boys and girls, you're never going to believe it. On my holiday to Croatia, one of the strongest men in the United Kingdom was there one of the strongest men in Great Britain. In 2017, he won the England's Strongest Man competition. He was a beast of a man. I mean, he was big. And I talked to that man about his life. You know what he told me? He said, I grew up and I wanted nothing to do with church. My mom and dad tried to sell me to church and I wanted nothing to do with it. And he said, whenever he grew up, he didn't go to church. He didn't want to undo his Sunday school. And he got into drinking a lot of alcohol. And he got into smoking and he got into doing a lot of things that he should not have been doing. And he lived a wicked life. And he said, I was happy in my life and I thought I had everything. I was winning all these strong men competitions and everybody loved me and I was making loads of money and I could do whatever I want. But he said, I was empty inside. And he said, I had to come to the cross and I had to come and ask Jesus to forgive me. And I had to become a Christian. And I just thought, this big strong man who thought he had everything he knew he had nothing and he had to be saved and he had to come to the cross and ask Jesus to forgive him. Boys and girls and older people, when you look at the cross, what do you see? Do you see that you're lost? 
Do you see that Jesus died for you? Do you see that you have to trust him? Boys and girls, I hope that whenever you look at the cross, it's not just a picture. It's not just a scene. It's not just something you hear about in the Bible. But you can say, Jesus died for me. And he's my savior. Let's close our eyes. Let's pray. Thank you, Ella. You can sit down. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our boys and girls here in Castle Dawson. Thank you for them all coming up to the front, Ross, and, and all the girls here. And thank you for all those who are in the pews and those who are maybe watching online and those who are maybe at camps over the summer. Father, we love our, our young people in Castle Dawson. We thank you for each one of them and for them coming to church. We love to see them in church from the very youngest baby to the very oldest person. We're glad they're all here. They should be here. We want them here. And yet, Father, more than that, we want them to grow up, not religious, but we want to see them growing up trusting in Jesus as their Savior, that they're saying, He died for me, and I love Him. So, Father, for these young people, we ask that they would grow up healthy and strong and well. We'd ask they'd have a brilliant summer off school, but more than anything, we would ask that they would know you and love you as their Savior. In His name we pray. Amen. Boys and girls, great to see you all in church. Thank you for all coming up the front. Do you want to go back to your seats now? We're going to sing your song, and later I'm going to invite you to go out to Children's Church. But we're going to sing your song now, which is, His Mercy is More. Boys and girls, I'm informed there's no children's church, but that's okay. I'm delighted that you're in church, and I'll try and make my sermon whenever I come to it simple so that you can understand, so we can all be un understand it. And if you have to reach down and ask mommy for a handbag or keys or a suite, that's okay. As long as dad doesn't do it, you can do it. But I'm really glad you're in church, and we're glad you're here. And keep coming over the summer. Don't think just because you're off school, you're off church. We want you here, and we're delighted that you're here. So thank you for coming. But we're going to pray now. And just as Granger, we're in our prayers, we're going to be thinking of the Montgomery's. Just as Granger said in the announcement, Joe Montgomery, the children, I think, are, are at camp this week. So she's going to be in Castle Dawson tonight, and I'm going to be interviewing her. So I'll give you an opportunity. I know you're great supporters of the Montgomery's in Castle Dawson and Curran. So make a special effort to come along tonight and hear that interview with Joe. Just a few moments to get an update. But let's come together now in prayer. Allow me to lead us as we pray. Heavenly Father, we know that this is a very significant week. It's the 12th of July this week. 
And Father, the 12th of July is in our mind for two reasons. Lord, we want to pray for the Montgomery's this 12th of July. We thank you in Ballina, down there in County Mayo, that they're having a National Heritage Day on the 12th. And we thank you that on that day that John and, and Joe will be seeking to do gospel outreach. They'll be just seeking to, to build relationships and to talk to people about Jesus and Jesus alone who gives life. And so we ask in the 12th in County Mayo that the gospel will go forward. Pray for John as he gives, I think he's maybe given 10 or 15 talks that day as he's trying to, to, to speak to children and older people about Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you'd help him. I pray that there'll be good weather and there'll be contacts made and there'll be bridges built. But more than anything, Lord, that John and Joe will be able to go across those bridges and build relationships that people might be saved. Father, we do remember the, the 12th here in Northern Ireland. We know that that's a different meaning. Father, we thank you that the Orange Order came out of the Protestant Reformation. And we know that to be reformed is just other name for being saved. We can use fancy language, but it's really talking about being a born-again Christian, a Bible-believing Christian. We know there's historical, we know there's cultural, but Father, ultimately, we want to say that the marks of an orange man are as a saved man, a born-again believer. And so, Father, we do want to pray for this 12th of July. We know that, Lord, there'll be many, and this is a significant day, a day to meet up with family and friends. And we ask, Lord, that for all those who this day is important, that you would bless that day that you would, Father, give them opportunity to speak to those who maybe haven't seen in a while. We pray for safety. We pray for good weather. Particularly remember the local uh, demonstrations in, in Port Lanone and Macrafelt. And we ask, Father, that they would go very well. We do thank you, Lord, that we live in a country where the gospel has been preached. We know that sometimes the gospel is hidden or confused, but we ask in our country, Lord, that the gospel would go out in power, that the gospel would go out in might, and that Lord, that it would be heard clearly, heard as it should be heard, and it be received as it should be received in repentance and faith as it's preached to all. Heavenly Father, we do pray that the gospel will go forward locally here in Castle Dawson. We do thank you for the shine week that's coming up, and Lord, this is a significant week for the church, and I thank you, Lord, that this is two congregations who've supported this mission year by year, very faithfully and dedicated. And we ask again, Lord, that you would bless Ask you to give the weather and the personnel and the people. And Father, more than anything, we're asking that you would open up doors. We ask that you would move in hearts and lives. We think of Paul's words to Timothy, that the gospel was to be preached in season and out of season. And sometimes, Father, we think, well, if it's not in season, then we're going to stop. But we ask, Father, that we would preach it in season and out of season. And when it's out of season, Lord, we ask that you'd make it season and that people would be saved. And so we'd ask that you'd bless that shine week. Father, we pray for our young people and our children. We know that many of them are going off in camp this week and in the weeks ahead and going off with CEF and SU and um, Hope for Youth Ministries with Colin Tinsley. And Father, we're asking that you'd bless we're asking that you would give enjoyable weeks and safe weeks. As the children are off school, Lord, we know that they can get up to all sorts, but we pray you'd keep them safe and bless them. And we'd ask that this summer would be a significant summer spiritually, that our children would hear and trust in Jesus, that they would come to saving faith in Jesus or go on in their faith, and you'd build them up over the summer. Father, for those who are away on holiday, we miss them. We ask you to be with them as they meet in some other part of the world in a service this Sunday. We ask you would speak to them. Lord, for those who are unable to get away on a summer holiday, who have commitments at home to older relatives, caring for neighbors and friends, for those who have commitments that forbid them and stop them from going very far, I ask that they would no rest. For those who have commitments in their place of work, who can't take a week off from the farm, the cows still need looked at, Lord, I pray that they would know your hand upon them and that they would know your enablement and grace. For those who are finding things financially tight and don't have that extra cash to, to disappear for a fortnight, Lord, I pray that they would know again your grace and your sufficiency. Our Father, we thank you that we can look to you. We thank you that we can call upon you. We thank you we can bring everything before you. And so we do that, and we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just before we turn to the Word, uh, we're going to stand and sing again the hymn, Speak, O Lord.
Well, if you have a Bible, can I encourage you to open it up to Mark's Gospel and to chapter 15. And we want to think about this bit of the Bible together. Boys and girls, when I was talking to you in the children's address, the question I asked you was, what do you see when you look at the cross? Now, I know the boys and girls are staying in church. Well, boys and girls, I have three things I want to talk about this morning. And I'm going to say, when you look at the cross, you have to see. And then I've got three words. And maybe at the end of church, if you come up to me at the end of the church and you're able to tell me the three things that you're to see when you look at the cross, I'll make sure John the next Sunday here gives you sweets, okay? Now, just do you remember that? So if you remember those three words and come up to me, I'll get your name and John will give you some sweets the next time he sees you. Is that a deal? Good. Well, look, we're going to look at the cross today. And we're going to think about the cross, young people and older people. And we want to look at the cross and ask ourselves, what are we looking at? What do we see? Maybe you're here in Castle Austin this morning, you've been a Christian for decades. What do you see when you look at the cross? Does it grip you? Does it do, do, do something to you? Maybe even as we were just doing the Bible reading, you kind of thought to yourself, this is holy ground I'm on this morning. I'm at the site where Jesus died for me. Or maybe you're here in Castle Dawson this morning and you're not yet a Christian. Maybe you're not even sure what a Christian is or you have questions. Well, I would really encourage you. I know it's sometimes hard listening to sermons and I would encourage you just to try and track with me as we move through this passage, Mark 15, because you'll find it really helpful this morning to hear what Mark has to say. And we think about what is a Christian? How do you become a Christian? What does it mean to ask God to come into your life? And we're going to ask, answer all those questions from Mark 15. Mark chapter 15 is about what do you see when you look at the cross? In 1859, they were doing excavation work in Rome. If you've been to Rome on your holidays, you probably have went to the Colosseum. And right beside the Colosseum, there's that Arch of Constantine. Then just to the right of the Arch of Constantine, you've got the Palatine Hill. Really worth going to see Rome all those incredible buildings from the first century. Well, off the Palatine Hill, kind of right at the back of the Palatine Hill, there's a palace called the Palace of Caligula. And that's the Caligula who persecuted Christians. That's the Caligula who was fierce in Christians. Whenever you read the book of 1 Peter, it was that Caligula who persecuted the Christians that Peter had to send them a letter about. Such was the extent of the persecution. But in 1859, they were doing excavation work around Caligula's palace, and they found graffiti. And the graffiti that they found was a body of a man, just a stick man, torso, arms, legs, and a head. But it was the head of a donkey. And then in front of this strange kind of man with a, a donkey's head, there was somebody in the ground, as it were, down before him bowing. And there was a line underneath it which said in Greek, Alexi Minos Sebatai Theon. And what it translated from, from Greek and English was, Alexi Minos worships his God. People often ask, is there any evidence for Christianity? Well, here's evidence of a Christian in the first century in Caligula's palace. His name was Alexi Minos, and he worshiped Jesus Christ. And that graffiti in Caligula's palace was mocking Alexi Minos because the man was stretched out in a crucifix shape with the head of a donkey, and he was being mocked. It was as if the person who was mocking him was saying, you worship a donkey. When I look at the cross, I just see a fool. Well, what do you see when you look at the cross? There are three things we want to think about. Here's the first one. Boys and girls, here's the first thing to remember. When you look at the cross, you're to see God's judgment. When you look at the cross, you're to see, number one, remember it, God's judgment judgment. We come to the cross this morning, and it's, uh, it's an April morning. This is probably AD 26. The calendar got a wee bit confused in the third century. This is about AD 26. This is the month of Nisan. We're outside the western wall of Jerusalem. We're on a hill called Skull Hill, and there's a, a man being crucified. In fact, there are three men being crucified, three crosses, all three of them are at eye level, and all three of them are completely naked. The beside a main road thoroughfare into that gate of Jerusalem, that western gate, because everybody's to see this sight. And in the man in the middle of the cross, well, he's been executed apparently because of treason. He'd already been through two trials. He'd been through a Jewish trial where he was charged with blasphemy, 
but the Romans had reserved capital punishment for themselves, and so the Jews couldn't crucify or kill anybody. He was charged with blasphemy, and the Jewish court convicted him. But then this man in the middle cross, he went before a Roman court, and the charge was changed from blasphemy to treason, because the Romans wouldn't execute you for blasphemy, but they would for treason. And so he was charged with another capital crime, whereby he could be crucified. And though it was a kangaroo court, Jesus Christ was led away to be crucified. And whenever we look at that cross, what do we see? Well, the first thing we see is God's judgment. Remember that, boys and girls. Look at verse 33. We read, And when the, ni- when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Mark records a phenomenal event. On that day in the month of Nisan, April 26 AD, there was darkness, not just over Jerusalem, but darkness over the whole world. It was dark in Castle Dawson that day. It was dark in Curran and Macrofelt and Portland. There was darkness everywhere that day. Your forefathers, if they had been in this area, it would have been dark from midday, 12 noon to 3 p.m. Now, if it had been an eclipse, An eclipse had only lasted for 12 minutes, but this goes on for three hours. Why this darkness for such a long period of time? What's this darkness over the whole world for? Well, the Old Testament tells us about darkness. You know what, and I know what the book of Isaiah. Isaiah writes, the sun will be dark at its rising. That's a sign of God's judgment. Or Amos speaks about the day of the Lord and says there will be darkness, and that will be dark in the earth and daylight. But probably the best known examples from the book of Exodus. Do you remember the Exodus? Exodus chapter 10, the ninth plague. I mean, just think of that. Just think of that way it set up that parallel. The darkness before the sacrifice in the book of Exodus. And now here we are thousands of years later and we have darkness before the sacrifice. Well, here we have darkness. When the darkness was over Egypt in Exodus chapter 10, it was a sign of God's judgment. The darkness is God is judging. God's pouring out his wrath. But this is not my interpretation. Jesus gives us the interpretation so that nobody could be confused. Just look at what Jesus says there in verse 34. We know that from the cross, Jesus said a number of things. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John all record different things Jesus said. But the only thing that Mark noted down verbatim was verse 34. He could have recorded Jesus saying a number of things, but this is the only thing he put in his gospel. Its significance is not to be overlooked. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just think back to Mark chapter 1 at Jesus' baptism. There's that voice from heaven. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. But now there is no voice from heaven. The only voice that's heard is Jesus is crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, and he cries out. It's as if, God, where are you? The God of lights has switched off the lights because Jesus is coming under the judgment of God. I was asked a question at a Q&A in a university once. They asked me the question, if you could go to one scene in the Bible and be present there, what scene would you want to be at? And I thought about it and I said, you know what scene I would love to go to? I would love to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's going through all that anguish and he speaks to the disciples and he says, could you not pray with me one hour? And he knows that he's going to go to the cross and then what happens? An angel comes and it says the angel strengthened him. I want to know what that angel said. I want to know what that angel said to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ was thinking about going to the cross and coming under the judgment of God, he would drink the full cup of God's wrath to the very dregs. And that angel said a word to him. Jesus came under the wrath of God. Jesus was being punished on the cross for our sin. Because we are lost, as I was saying to the boys and girls, and we need someone to pay for our sin. And on the cross, Jesus paid. For those three hours, Jesus was coming under the wrath and the judgment of God. Maybe you're talking to somebody in work and they say to me, I don't believe that message. I don't believe there's a hell. I mean, I've read in the Bible about God as a God of love. How could a God of love and how could a God of grace and how could a God of mercy send anybody to hell? What a load of nonsense. Have you heard that? Well, my response is this. If you do not believe that God will punish sin, What do you think was happening on the cross? 
Do you think you're perfect and faultless and sinless? Well, God punished his perfect, faultless, sinless son, Jesus. He came under God's wrath for that time, and you think that he won't punish you? On the cross, Jesus Christ was coming under the judgment of God. He was forsaken in the darkness. Isaiah says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. On the cross, Jesus Christ was separated from the Father to such a way that he would come under his judgment. The psalmist tells us, Psalm 75, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine. The wicked of the earth shall shall drain it down to the dregs. On the cross, Jesus was coming under the wrath and the judgment of God. You could say, Jesus Christ on the cross was going through hell so that you and I wouldn't have to go to hell. On the cross, Jesus was being punished so that you and I wouldn't be punished. On the the cross, Jesus Christ was enduring hell so that we might go to heaven. If you look at the cross, young people, children, if you look at the cross and you don't think you're lost and you don't think that you deserve the punishment of God, then you're missing out what the cross is telling us. It's telling us that Jesus Christ died there for sinful people and experienced the wrath of God. Do you want to experience the wrath of God? Well, either you'll pay for your sin or Jesus will pay for your sin. And they're the only two places where sin will be paid for. You will be in hell for all eternity because you cannot pay. But Jesus, he did pay. And Jesus was able to say, it's finished. Your sins have been paid for. That's the first thing. Boys and girls, remember, whenever we look at the cross, we see God's judgment and we should flee from it. Here's the second thing. What do we see when we look at the cross? Well, boys and girls, I hope you're listening. The second thing we see when we look at the cross is we see Christ's love. Let me ask you a question. How did Jesus die? Now, many of you have been coming to church for decades. How did Jesus die? You've went to Sunday school. You've went to children's church. You've heard many sermons on it. How did Jesus die? Well, we know that Jesus was crucified, but crucifixion didn't kill Jesus. Just let's look at it here, verses 35 to 37. And some of the bystanders hearing it, they heard Jesus' words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. They heard Jesus crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But whenever they heard Jesus crying out, Eloi, they thought he was saying, Elijah. Now, Elijah was taken up to heaven and a world went afire. We know that from the book of Kings. And there was this tradition in Judaism that they thought, and the same way that Jesus went up to heaven was the same, or the same way Elijah went up was the way he was going to come down. And they hear Jesus crying, Elijah, and they think he's calling Elijah. So then they run and get some drink for Jesus. Now, it's really interesting, these drinks. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine. This sour wine It's the second time Jesus has been offered a drink. They put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And then it says, notice that, and then it says, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Well, what's going on here? Well, you could die from a crucifixion, but to die from crucifixion would probably take about 24 hours. You know that. Yes, you experienced pain in your wrists and your ankles. Yes, they broke your legs. But Whenever you were on a cross, you died from asphyxiation. You died because you couldn't breathe, not because of blood loss. And the Romans didn't want a quick death. I mean, the way that works for us in the 20th century is we want somebody to die quickly. That's why we gas or a lethal injection in an instant. But the Romans didn't want that. They wanted the death to go on as long as possible. They wanted to make a public spectacle of this death. So crucifixion could take anything from 24 hours up to three days. And then eventually you would die because you couldn't raise yourself up to breathe. And you did die from crucifixion, but Jesus didn't die from crucifixion. He was crucified, but he didn't die from crucifixion. Look at these drinks with me a minute. In verse 23, just look at that drink. It says, And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh. Well, you know what wine does. Wine makes you a bit tipsy. I mean, it numbs the senses. And this wine mixed with myrrh was supposed to be an anesthetic. It was supposed to lessen the pain of being crucified. And crucifixion, as the name gives us, is excruciating. But it was supposed to lessen the pain. But when Jesus was offered that there in verse 23, look at it. It says, um, but he did not take it. He didn't take this drink that was going to numb the pain. 
Jesus was saying, I'm going to be wide awake for all that happens to me. We know that Jesus, according to the psalmist in Psalm 22, we know that Jesus' tongue was on the roof of his mouth. His tongue had so swollen because of all that he'd experienced. But he didn't take that drink. But then whenever they come to him the second time and they offer him the next drink, they offer him a different drink. They offer him not wine to be used as an anesthetic. It says in verse 36, not 23, 36 this time. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine. This is bitter wine. This is wine that's going to wake you up. Put it on a reed and give it to him to drink. And he drinks the sour wine. He drinks the drink that's going to wake you up. And he refuses the drink that's going to numb you down. Why did he do that? Because Jesus is going to gather himself. And Jesus is going to make a loud cry. This is a loud cry that everybody hears. And Jesus cries with a loud voice, it's finished. And how did Jesus die? Jesus gave his life. Nobody took it from him. Do you remember Mark's gospel, what Jesus said in Mark 10, verse 45, he said, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. How did Jesus die? Jesus offered up his life. Jesus gave his life. Nobody took it from him. It wasn't that Jesus was caught up in circumstances. We know the book, we know the verse in Hebrews which says, it is appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. Well, it was appointed to Jesus to die. All the way through the Bible, we know that Jesus is moving towards the cross. I mean, we think of Luke chapter 9, where it says, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. We think of Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark 10, where Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to, be, I'm going to be lifted, and I'm going to be executed. Jesus was deliberately going to the cross. And why was he going to the cross? To give his life. Nobody was going to take it from him. He was going to offer it. And why did he do that? Because he loved you. He loved you so much he would die for you. Boys and girls, when you look at the cross, you have to see the judgment of God, but you also have to see the love of Jesus Christ. We know that verse in Romans 5, yet God demonstrates his love for us, and that yet we were sinners. Christ died for us. Or Romans 5, or John 15, 13, greater love is no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friend. Jesus Christ knew about you, and he died for you. I mean, whenever I was walking along the, the top of that wall in Dubrovnik and the man was selling the pictures for 30 euros, I didn't think he would put me in the picture, but he said, no problem. And he just got out his pen and there it was. He drew me in the picture and there I was captured for time and all eternity on the walls of Dubrovnik. But I'm not joking you. When you think about the cross, you have to put yourself in the picture. You have to say, I was standing there. Whenever Jesus died, it was as if Jesus looked down at the cross and he looked at me. It was my sin that he took upon himself. I thought that I was a freak or an accident. He knew about me. He paid for me. It was as if Jesus signed a check. He didn't leave the check blank. He just didn't sign it. He put in the figure, the full figure of all the sins that he was going to pay for. And he paid for you because he knew about you. He knew exactly about you, and he loved you so much, he said, I'll go to the cross, and there I'll die for my people. When you look at the cross, the first thing, boys and girls, you with me? You have to see God's judgment. Here's the second one. You have to see Christ's love. And here's the third. Remember it now. You have to see your one and only hope. You have to see where hope is, and you have to run to it. I don't know where you're going on your holidays. I I remember growing up, I always wanted to go to far off places. I never left the United Kingdom until I was 18. And one of the things that I wanted to do when I got my own passport was get in a plane and go somewhere and see some of the world. And I've seen a wee bit. You've maybe just seen more than me. But one of the things that I've noticed in all the places I've traveled to is there seems to be something that people always want to try and find their way to God. I remember I went to Peru up in the Andes there in Machu Picchu, you know that really famous site? Maybe you saw pictures of it. And right there in that Inca site in Machu Picchu, there you find a stone table. And on that stone table, a human sacrifice was made. And on that stone table, there was a human sacrifice made by the perfect Inca. And that perfect Inca was trying to make it possible by sacrifice for the Inca people to know an unknown God. Isn't that interesting? Then I remember going over to China and to Beijing, and the Chinese had a temple. And this temple's been going on for millennia, and this was the temple that they called the Temple of Heaven and Earth. And there the Chinese emperor 
would go to the temple, the temple of heaven and earth, and there he would make a blood sacrifice so that the people might go from earth up to heaven. And you think to yourself, isn't this interesting? Isn't there something seems to be in these Inca people and these uh, Chinese people that they all think that a sacrifice has to be made to go from earth to heaven? I mean, where did they get that from? Sure, it's corrupted. Sure, it's twisted. Sure, it's idolatry. But isn't it interesting there's a kernel of truth there somewhere? Where does that come from? It comes from Mark 15. Because whenever Jesus died on the cross, we're told that He alone opened up the way to the one true and living God. There are many people and there are many cultures and there are many people groups around the world and they all think they're making their way to a God, but there's only one true and living God and it's the God of the Bible and there's only one way to Him and it's through Jesus Christ. And we're given a visual representation of it here. I mean, look at verse 38. Where is this hope found? And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The temple was a place where God especially dwelt with his people, and that holy of holies, a kind of picture for us of heaven according to the writer of Hebrews. But Jesus opened up the way. You can go to Port Lanone or Port Rush, you can go to Peru, or you can go to the far ends of the earth, and the only way that you will ever be able to come to God is through Jesus Christ. When you look at the cross, let me ask you the question again. When you look at the cross, what do you see? I told the boys and girls about that man, Phil, that I met. I mean, think of it, England's strongest man, 2017. A big man, but whenever he came to the cross and he understood what Jesus was doing on the cross, this big, strong man said, I need to humble myself and I need to know that Jesus died for me and that Jesus loved me so much that I need to be saved. But I don't use the word casually see here by chance or by coincidence. The word see is really important. I mean, we know that faith comes through hearing. That's what Paul says in Romans. But actually what we're finding in Mark chapter 15 is whenever one man looked at the cross, he saw something and he believed. Now, there are a lot of people around this cross. I would love to know how about Simon and Cyrene. Simon and Cyrene, I think, got saved when they saw Jesus going to the cross because we're told his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, they become Christians. But he looked at the cross and he saw something, but Mark doesn't focus there. We know the religious leaders, they looked at the cross and they saw something, but Mark doesn't focus there. Mark focuses on a big, strong man, a rough man, a soldier, and Mark tells us that this man, possibly the man that nailed Jesus to the cross, a man who had been at many executions, who I'm sure had killed many people, whenever he looked at the cross, what did he see? Well, Mark tells us, verse 39, that this Roman soldier, this centurion, he looked at the cross, and whenever he saw the darkness, and it says, when he saw the way in which he died, he said, surely this man is the Son of God. So when you look at the cross, What do you see? Do you see that Jesus took on the punishment for your sin? Do you see that he loved you so much that he died for you? And do you see that he is your only hope? My prayer is that you will see that this morning and you will run to him. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Our gracious Father, we thank you so much that we can hear about what happened at the cross. And in our minds, we can look there and we can see And Father, we ask that we would be like that Roman centurion, and maybe we're weak, or maybe we're backslidden, or maybe we're falling or faltering, but we would look, and that we would see, and that we would believe, and that we would trust in Jesus. So Father, we ask that you would minister to us, and that you would bury this cross in our hearts, that we would be like uh, the Negro spiritual, and whenever the song is questions asked, were you there when they crucified my Lord? We would answer, yes, I was there. And he died for me. As in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to finish this morning uh, by singing, Like a River Glorious is his perfect peace.
Just before I give the benediction, can I leave an invitation with you? If you would like to speak to somebody about being saved or like to speak to somebody about maybe coming back to the Lord, just grab me at the door. I'll be in this door here, and I'm happy to talk to you. I'm happy to take any questions. Or if you want to speak to your minister, just phone up John. He'll only be too delighted to speak to you. Maybe you want to read something. Maybe you want a recap of the message I've preached this morning. Just ask me at the door for this little booklet. It's Journey into Life. Ask it for yourself, and I'll only be too happy to give it to you. But let me pray. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority both now and forevermore. Amen.